Please a round of applause as we welcome and receive him upstage. Thank you. Rahim. Your Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasser Ahmed Arufai, Your Highness, the Amy of Zazo, Ahmed Nuhubamali, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my presentation today is on the theme of this summit, which is transitioning to a sustainable knowledge-based economy. And let me begin by way of setting a context by congratulating the Kaduna State Government for thinking ahead, as I said yesterday, for looking at the future and for preparing the state for the crisis that we are in and the crisis that is to come. Your Excellency, you have taken a number of difficult and unpopular decisions. Decisions that every economist will agree were absolutely necessary to place this state on the path of fiscal sustainability, reducing the cost of governance, attracting foreign investment, encouraging private sector participation in the economy, and as I said, taking serious political risks in the short term in order to secure the long-term future of the state. And these are the decisions that this country needs to take. And you have provided leadership and given an indication of the kind of leadership that we need if this country is not to go bankrupt. My prayer is that after you finish your term, whoever succeeds you will build on what has been done. Uh, because as we know, it is very easy for all the work that's been done in years to be destroyed in one day. We have seen institutions, we have seen um, strong institutions unravel within a few months of having the wrong leadership. Uh, so I pray uh, that Allah grant the people of Kaduna leadership that will continue to build on the work that's been done so that the future generation will benefit from all the work that we're doing now. These things need time. And we'll see with the examples we give that the countries that did this, um, did this over 20 years, over 40 years, um, but it started at one point with one leader. So I begin my presentation with a slide I referred to yesterday. Now that slide basically tells us why we are going the way we're going. You have countries and their per capita GDP, and we have resource-rich countries and countries that are considered knowledge economies. On the horizontal axis, we have the knowledge intensity. On the vertical axis, we have per capita GDP. And all you have to do is look at the direction of the dots to see that as you become more knowledge intensive, your per capita GDP increases. As an example, look at the countries that we here consider rich countries. Look at Saudi Arabia. Look at Bahrain, look at Kuwait. 
we consider these very rich countries. And that's, the, the, that's where they are on per capita income. Now compare Saudi Arabia to Singapore. Or to Finland. Or to Switzerland. Or to the US. Or even to the United Arab Emirates. You know, we all think Saudi is richer than UAE. But look at the per capita income. And what is the reason? The UAE is further down on the global knowledge index. They are at 58, while Saudi Arabia is at 44. So, if there is any evidence that this is the right path, this is the evidence that you need. As you increase the knowledge intensity of your economy, as you rely more on human capital, as you rely more on intellectual capacity, and less on natural resources, you reduce poverty and increase per capita income. And that is what uh, you're supposed to do. So, the next slide basically starts with a definition which we've heard from the Vice President yesterday on what is a knowledge economy. And we have a number of illustrative definitions it's one where you have a greater reliance on intellectual capabilities than on physical inputs or natural resources. The OECD defines knowledge-based economy as one where advanced economies are basically moving towards greater dependence on knowledge, information, and high skill levels. While the World Bank defines a knowledge economy as one that creates, disseminates, and uses knowledge to enhance its growth and development. Now globally, work is being redefined. 30 to 40% of workers in developed economies will need to significantly upgrade their skills and reskill into new occupations by 2030. Now what are the major drivers of this redefinition? There's digitization and remote working which we have seen even here with COVID. There is increased automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, very soon, the robots will take over the work in many countries, and those that will have jobs will be those who are able to operate the robots or manufacture the robots or, um, uh, or, or service the robots. And you have decarbonization. For us in Nigeria, um, the enclave economy we have, the so-called goose that lays the golden egg is about to die. There will be no eggs. The future is not in hydrocarbons. A few months ago, Germany was able to produce enough renewable energy for its entire country's needs. Today, we're having difficulties selling Nigerian oil. The United States, India, they're not buying. So not only are we not able to produce, even if we produce, the market is not there. Um, so this is forcing a change. And for us, a country that has depended on oil, this makes the, the, uh, the change even more urgent, more pressing. Now, on the right, I have further issues exacerbating the situation with Nigeria. Only 9% of new graduates find employment. So we have an incremental 4.5 million added to the unemployed annually. This is Nigeria. Only 9% of graduates find employment. 41% is the number for youth unemployment. Whereas, overall, we have 27% unemployment among the youth. It is 41%, which is the most serious um, component of the population, because that's where you have restiveness, that's where you have thuggery, that's where you have crime, that's where you have insecurity. Nigeria is ranked 114th in the Global Innovation Index. We are lower than other African countries, such as Kenya, such as Rwanda, 
and Senegal. We are in fact ranked 14th in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we should have these reality checks and know where we are as a country. Let's not, we continue calling ourselves, um, what do we call ourselves, the giant of Africa, huh? We are the giant of Africa. We are a giant with clay feet. Okay? So, we are 14th in innovation in sub-Saharan Africa. Countries like Senegal and Rwanda and Kenya are ahead of us. I'm not even talking about South Africa. Our federation, our expenditure as a country on education is only 7% of the budget. 7%. We're spending less on education than Ghana. I'm not talking about as a percentage of the budget. In absolute terms, even though the Ghanaian economy is much smaller than the Nigerian economy, even though the Ghanaian government revenue is less than the Nigerian government revenue, Ghana is spending more on education than Nigeria. And we're surprised that companies are moving to Ghana. We're surprised that industries are moving them. We're surprised that individuals are going there. We're surprised that the Ghanaian president has become the leading uh, president in Africa. We are not investing in education and human capital. We have a 68% mismatch between graduate skills and job requirements. The major areas being IT, communication, and decision making. And the completion rate between entry into primary one and completing university is 8%. Out of every 100 children who go into primary one, only eight end up coming out of university. And out of those eight, 9%, which is about one, <laughs> will get a job. So this is the reality, um, in addition to what is happening globally. Now, digitization provides an opportunity to level the playing field. If we are deliberate, and if we shift from consumption to value creation. I made this point at last year's um, summit. Part of our problem is that even when we have the solution at hand, we do not take it. And I give the example of the mobile phone. You know, you, you have this mobile phone, you, you paid for it, and when you bought it, it was probably produced in the UK, so that is adding to UK GDP. You sit in your room, you think you've arrived, you want to go to England, Go on the internet, buy a BA ticket, and you're happy. You send in money again to the UK, British Airways. You sit on your phone, book your hotel, nice suite, Hilton Park Lane, London. Send money again to the UK. You book your car <laughs> from the airport send money again to the UK. Maybe you have Deliveroo, you book your food, send money to the UK on this phone. Every single expenditure from buying the phone to using the internet has been transferring wealth from Nigeria to the UK. And then we are surprised that those countries are getting richer and we're getting poorer. Meanwhile, you could use this phone for fintech, you could use it for logistics, you could use this same technology to produce Nollywood movies. You could turn this phone into a factor of production, creating jobs within Nigeria, in agriculture, in manufacturing, which is what those countries have done. And that's the difference between a knowledge economy and a consumer economy. So long as we continue taking this technology as consumption. It's like electricity. If you use, I mean, industrial revolution started with the discovery of the coal engine. It was, once electricity was discovered, 
it was used for industrialization in Europe. What are we using electricity for? We're watching Manchester United versus Arsenal. Air condition. Lights, street lights, you know, beautiful lights. We're consuming. And that's why when you say pay electricity tariff, people cry. Because electricity does not contribute to their earnings, it's just consumption. So the whole idea of a knowledge-based economy is to train people to turn themselves from being consumers into being producers through innovation. So that was set in the context. And let's look at the critical enablers and consideration for Kaduna. I said yesterday when launching the plan that when I went through